Welcome to another video from 55 Degrees North. Today we're uncovering the remarkable history of one of Newcastle's most iconic landmarks, the High Level Bridge. But before we get into the engineering, let's step back in time. In the 1700s and early 1800s, there was only one bridge linking Newcastle and Gateshead, the medieval Low Level Bridge. It was fine for foot traffic, carts and pack horses, but for anyone moving goods on an industrial scale, it was a nightmare. Merchants and farmers had to descend steep winding roads to the water, cross the narrow bridge, then climb all the way up to the opposite bank. Imagine the delays, the bottlenecks and the frustration in the region booming with coal and trade. Visionaries began dreaming of something better. In 1825, the great engineer Thomas Telford suggested a bold new high-level bridge. But the idea stalled. Too costly, too ambitious and at the time perhaps too far ahead of its age. Everything changed with the coming of the railway. By the 1840s, the York and Newcastle Railway reached the gates at side of the town. Meanwhile, the Brandland Junction and the Newcastle and Carlisle lines converged on the north bank. The result, a dead end. The trains from the south terminated on one side of the river, while trains to Scotland began on the other. A high-level crossing wasn't just desirable, it was essential. This is where George Hudson, known as the Railway King, enters the story. Hudson, alongside local industrialist John Hodgson Hind, launched the High Level Bridge Company. Their vision was unique, a bridge that would serve both trains and ordinary road traffic. The idea caught Parliament's attention. In 1845, the Newcastle and Berwick Railway Act authorised the project, but raising the money? This was another story. The High Level Bridge wasn't a government project, it was private enterprise. Investors were invited through shares, but enthusiasm was limited. Eventually, the Newcastle and Darlington Junction Railway absorbed the scheme. Cost ballooned to over £491,000 for a bridge and its approaches equivalent to tens of millions today. Contracts were awarded to some of the North's great industrial firms. Hawks, Crossley and Sons of Gateshead supplied over 5,000 tonnes of cast iron. John Rush and Benjamin Lawton of York handled the massive masonry piers. But money wasn't just spent on iron and stone. Whole communities were uprooted. More than 650 families in Newcastle and 130 in Gateshead were forced from their homes to clear space for the approaches. Progress often came at a human price. The consultant engineer was none other than George Stevenson. But the detailed design came from his son, Robert Stevenson, and Thomas E. Harrison. What they proposed was revolutionary. A double-deck bridge, trains above, carriages and foot traffic below. Six spans, each 125 feet across, used a then novel concept. The wrought iron tied arch of bowstring cast iron ribs carried the load, while wrought iron chains held everything in tension. Masonry piers, each 50 feet thick, anchored the structure deep into the town's bedrock. This design didn't just save material, it turned the bridge into one of the great icons of Victorian structural engineering. Work began in 1846. The first challenge, the town's treacherous riverbed. Engineers had to drive piles through up to 30 feet of quicksand and silt. For this, they used James Naismith's brand new steam pile driver, a cutting edge invention. To keep traffic moving, a temporary wooden viaduct was erected alongside. Imagine the sight of trains crossing a timber skeleton while beside it, iron arches slowly rose into the sky. By 1849, over 10,000 tonnes of iron had been assembled. On August 11th, the structure was tested. Four days later, the first passenger train rumbled across. 
and on the 28th of September 1849, Queen Victoria herself rode over in her royal train. Newcastle had its marvel. The road deck opened in February 1850. From day one, tools applied. One penny for vehicles, a half penny for pedestrians. Horse-drawn brakes crossed in the 1880s and by 1923 electric trams connecting Newcastle and Gateshead via the high-level bridge. For nearly 90 years the bridge doubled as both a public utility and a commercial venture until 1937 when the Newcastle and Gateshead Corporation bought out the toll rights for £160,000. In 1866 Disaster nearly struck. A fire in a corn mill spread to the bridge's timber deck. Flames licked along the roadway. Workmen suspended on ropes through holes in the deck poured water onto the blaze. Against all odds, the iron arches were saved. But time and technology placed new demands. Heavier locomotives required stronger supports. By the 1890s, cast iron girders gave way to steel in the 1920s, the road deck was renewed, ready to carry trams as well as carts. By the early 1900s, the high-level bridge was struggling. Its three rail tracks were overloaded. In 1906, the King Edward Bridge opened just upstream, providing a four-track alternative. The high level became less of a mainline artery and more of a local connector, still essential but no longer dominant. Through the mid-20th century, the bridge soldiered on. Timber was replaced with steel, tracks reduced from three to two, and weight limits imposed. But by the 1990s, however, corrosion and cracking raised fears for its survival. The future of the high-level bridge was at stake. In 2001, Network Rail and the local councils launched a monumental refurbishment. Eight years of work strengthened the arches, replaced road beams, restored ironwork and even introduced an alternative load path so if one arch failed, the others could hold. Road traffic was restricted to buses and taxis with a single narrow lane. For pedestrians, access was briefly cut off. But in June 2008, the bridge reopened, gleaming, strengthened and awarded the Europa Nostra Grand Prize for conservation, it was a triumph of heritage preservation. Today, the high-level bridge remains part of the East Coast mainline, though the bulk of the trains use the King Edward Bridge. For Newcastle locals, it's more than transport, it's part of the skyline. In 2023 and 2024, another £5.2 million programme saw repainting, drainage repair and waterproofing. 3,300 litres of paint and 460 tonnes of scaffold kept the bridge alive for yet another generation. The bridge has inspired not just engineers, but artists and musicians. Fiddler James Hill composed the high-level hornpipe in its honour, a tune still played today. Folk band the high-level ranters even took their name from it. But the bridge's fame goes beyond music. In 1971, it appeared on the silver screen in the cult British crime film Get Carter, starring Michael Caine. The high-level bridge provided a gritty industrial backdrop that perfectly captured the mood of Tyneside at the time. For many, it was their first cinematic glimpse of this Victorian giant. Its iron ribs have appeared in countless photographs and paintings, and even film, cementing it not just as infrastructure, but as culture. From fire to floods, from tools to trams, from decline to renewal, the high-level bridge has endured. It's an engineering landmark, but also a cultural one, immortalised in music through the high-level hornpipe and captured forever on film in Get Carter. The bridge stands as a symbol of both Newcastle's industrial grit and its creative spirit. Today, over 170 years since its opening, the high-level bridge still carries trains, buses and cyclists and pedestrians across the town. 
but it also carries stories of visionaries, workers and the city it connects. A bridge not only crosses the river, but it crosses time itself. And before you go, please leave a comment below with your thoughts on the bridge. Give the video a massive thumbs up as it really helps the channel grow. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell notification for more videos. A massive thank you for watching and I'll see you next time right here on 55 Degrees North.